Managing a team of investigators just got easier with TrackOps, the all-in-one case management software. Are you ready to enhance case flows and drive efficiency? TrackOps offers powerful management and coordination tools to streamline workflows and communication, all designed to keep your team synchronized and focused on the task at hand. With TrackOps, you can easily distribute workloads, track individual performance, and ensure deadlines are met. Plus, the TrackOps mobile app allows investigators to access case activities on the go. And the TrackOps video app allows for simple and consistent timestamping, all included at no extra cost. Start streamlining your investigation process today. Visit trackops.com for a free 15-day trial and experience the power of efficient team management. TrackOps, empowering teams, simplifying management. This episode is brought to you by Four Pillars Research, a nationwide leader in policy limit searches, now expanding its services to support private investigators working with injury attorneys. Since 2019, Four Pillars Research has been known for its professionalism and top-tier customer service. If you're a private investigator, you know how crucial it is to provide accurate and complete information to your clients. Research can be time-consuming and challenging, especially when accuracy is non-negotiable. That's where Four Pillars Research comes in. Unlike other firms that outsource their work, Four Pillars handles everything in-house, ensuring you receive precise policy limit details of the at-fault party before litigation even begins. With Four Pillars, you get more than just data. Each client is paired with a dedicated client engagement specialist, ensuring personalized service and meticulous attention to detail. And for those of you handling multiple cases, they even offer loyalty programs for high volume clients. So if you're looking to elevate your investigative work and provide your clients with the best possible service, contact Four Pillars Research today. Let them handle the complex research so you can focus on delivering results. That's Four Pillar Research, your trusted partner in policy limit research. Reach out now and take your investigative services to the next level. Do you enjoy our podcast and the guests we bring you? Since 2019, Matt and his team have done their very best to give you amazing shows each week. If you feel like our show has helped you to be a better investigator, or maybe even inspired you to become an investigator, please let us know. We're looking for testimonials. Drop Matt an email with a recorded 20 to 30 seconds of you talking about this podcast. You can also email him something verbal about the website. His email is Matthew S. at SatellitePI.com. And if you really feel blessed for having this content, consider supporting Matt and our show by joining Investigators Toolbox. You really have to see version 2.0. And at just 49 cents a day, it's a no-brainer. Now let's jump in to this week's episode. Welcome to this week's episode of PI Perspectives. Today we have a special one. Matt welcomes back Jim Gagliano. Jim had an amazing career with the FBI and then worked for CNN as a law enforcement analyst. The guys discussed the state of law enforcement investigations and the struggle to continue to operate in private practice as the political environment affects our professional relationships. Recently, the mayor of New York City was indicted, and this has affected the New York City Police Department. This episode touches on how to navigate as an investigator in these politically tense times. So please welcome Jim Gagliano and your host, private investigator Matt Spare. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of PI Perspectives. This is Matt Spare, your host. Um, some strange things are going on here in New York, and I thought, uh, let's go back to the well and let, let's talk to somebody who's in the know and... and uh, uh, a, a, a law enforcement analyst who I just, I just love. He's just a great guy. So Jimmy Gagliano, welcome back to the program. How are you? Maddie? thanks for having me. Boy, uh, we got a lot to talk about. And I always appreciate you giving people a platform um, to be able to kind of flesh out what's going forward. Your background speaks for itself. And uh, you and I always communicate, not just on, on this form or this platform, but it just it lets me know how much you care about the issues before us. So I'm looking forward to getting into it. Definitely. Definitely. So, you know, I, I'm president of my state association. Um, got my fingers on the pulse of kind of what's going on in New York. 
Um, and for those of you who don't know what's going on in New York, I mean, where, where you've been, <laughs> the indictments are falling like rain, uh, which is, has been pretty crazy. Um, Jimmy, tell everybody your background a little bit before we, we jump into it. So um, I, I, I started out in the military. I'm a West Point graduate, spent four years in the Army in the late 1980s before things heated up, of course, during the, the height of the Cold War, um, and then joined the FBI in 1991, was an FBI agent from 1991 until I retired in 2016, worked everything from... Italian organized crime to um, to, to 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 drug cases. Uh, spent many years on the FBI's New York office SWAT team. Served as a senior team leader there for a while. Spent four years on the FBI's hostage rescue team. Served as the New York office's crisis management coordinator, and then led the upstate office for the FBI's New York office, which covered Orange, Dutchess, and Sullivan counties. Um, and then my final tour, I spent over in Mexico City as the deputy legal attache and then the acting legal attache um, for the FBI director over in uh, over in Mexico City for a year. And again, retired in 2016. So law enforcement is my background. It's it's what I'm about. And sure. um, I currently serve on the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund Board of Directors. And I am a doctoral candidate in Homeland Security at St. John's University. I, I care, as I know you do, um, yeah. greatly about this profession. Yeah, and, and that's what it really comes down to and why I asked you to, to come on here today, because uh, you know, your passion for advocating for law enforcement and, and you know, having an opinion about things, you were on CNN for, for a bit. Um, you do uh, commenting every now and then you'll, you'll come in, uh, I'll see your name kicking around in an article or, or you're out there on the forefront, just advocating, um, for law enforcement. So it, it's kind of like, and what I wanted to talk about today is just, you know, a barometer of what it's like to do business in an environment that's essentially crumbling around you, whether it be you're an actually in law enforcement or that you're retired law enforcement and you know, you're, you're trying to have that that post LE career, where now all your contacts are falling apart uh, because everyone's scrambling to say, "Hey, am I going to have a job tomorrow?" Um, what, what's your take on all this and what's going down? And we're we're talking about the indictments of the the uh, police commissioner stepped down, and now the mayor of New York is is indicted. So, what, what's your take on that? Sure. Well, I mean, in speaking about New York City in particular, I mean, the police commissioner um, had his had his personal home in Manhattan, an apartment um, visited by the FBI, and um, they conducted a search there. Uh, full disclosure, I know Tommy Donlin many, many years. Um, uh, we were both FBI colleagues. We worked overseas in some of the most austere and inhospitable places you could possibly work together, as in sure. Africa and the Middle East and in some of the toughest places on earth. I have great respect for him, but I needed to kind of put that disclaimer out front. So sure. I obviously have a personal relationship there. Um, I also have great respect, as I know you do, for the New York Police Department. Um, the New York Police Department is the oldest and the largest police department in the United States. It's uh, been around since the 19th century. Um, the men and women there, um, 36,000 police officers, a very large department, and really one of the most discerning um, departments that there is. Uh, my, my, my dissertation for St. John's and Homeland Security is looking at officer-involved shootings and police-involved deaths st starting in 2000 all the way up to 2022 and trying to determine if there are any racial disparities exist, as you would believe there do if you listen to the mainstream media. And sure. <clears throat> I'm happy to give your listeners and your viewers a sneak peek to say, I haven't found them. And I'm using facts. I'm using publicly available data and I'm doing research and doing all the things that somebody that's trying to get a doctorate should do. Having yeah. said that, um, yeah, New York's in a tough place right now. It, it, it is. I mean, the mayor of New York is is under indictment. Um, he's obviously entered a plea of not guilty and he is innocent until proven guilty. That's the way 100%. our system works. Yep. Yep. Um, but his his police chief also is kind of battling some some different factors. And, and we all know that um, the NYPD, again, 
the greatest police department in the history of the world. I'll, I'll make that pronouncement. Yeah. Um, and that's not hyperbole. I truly believe that having worked with them for so many years, but you sure. bring an outsider in and you put him in, I understand why there might be some pushback and I'm not suggesting that that's what caused the investigation, but I, I think Mr. Donlin will, will get through this. This was involving some documents that he had from 20 years ago that, you know, might not have been, should have been taken out of, uh, out of, you know, the FBI, nothing classified from what I understand. And I'm not speaking him personally, but from what I understand through channels, but he's got to work his way through that. But to your point, I'll wrap up by saying police, the policing profession, recruitment and retention is a big issue for those of us that, that support the profession of law enforcement. And sure. it's because, you know, young kids are trying to enter into a profession where they know they're going to be underpaid. And unfortunately, they're not going to receive the support that police officers and law enforcement officers received in the past, Matt. So yeah. this is going to be a problem. I mean, nobody wants to stay on the job. They want to retire as soon as they can. And it's hard to bring people into it. And I think it's something that we should look at, acknowledge and try to fix. Yeah. And then you get to the point where you start moving up the ladder in your career. Right. And it, it starts becoming not so much about being out in the field. It starts becoming political, you know, as you're advancing to those higher of the highest levels of any department, you know, you, you start, it starts becoming an issue of like, what party is the, um, the DA, right. And like, who, who's the mayor, who's the governor, like that all plays into it. And it's so interesting when you start having those conversations, uh, I, I was just recently up in Albany. Um, we had an event with Sheriff uh, Craig Apple, um, who is what a guy, like really, really, really cool guy. And he's the sheriff of the year for 2024. He beat out 3,000 sheriffs around the country to be named the sheriff of the year. And that's a reflection on his department. But, you know, having a conversation with him about the politics of promotion very, very interesting to see how you do it. I look at John Rowan's another guy out in Suffolk County where the writing was on the wall and he's like, it may be time to retire here because the, uh, the, the way the politics are going here, I, I just, it's too much for me. Right. Yeah. So it's very interesting to see that happen. Well, I mean, it happens where, I mean, look at it from the federal level. So the FBI director and the attorney general, the attorney general for the United States is the boss of the FBI director. But those are political appointments. And, and again, you say, well, Jimmy, what those are apolitical offices. Yes, you're absolutely correct in that. However, they are political appointments. Whoever gets elected president is allowed to determine who the attorney general is and, and who the FBI director is and a number of other positions in the executive branch. But Things have happened of recent where I think it has caused people to look at and and be concerned whether it's legitimate or not that, wow, it looks like these some of these decisions make made in the Justice Department or some of these decisions made in local police departments or in local sheriff's offices where that can be an appointed position or an elected position. Wow, does, is politics finally infecting this? Is it impacting decisions that are made? We're going to yeah. go after our enemies and we're going to protect our friends. I think 99% of the time, that is much ado about nothing. But I think a portion of the time, it's something that we should be concerned about. And Matty, you know as well as I do, it's not what actually happens or what's fact or truth. It's also the perception. perception and that's what yeah. we're facing right now. Yeah. I mean, and it always cranks up every four years around September, October, November, you know, <laughs> it's just the nature of the, 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 the beast, uh, you know, where we're in and, you know, it, it, it really trickles down though. You know, policy that's established trickles down to the the boots on the ground that are out there, and and how it all it gets affected. So it's it's concerning to me to see just how everything's deteriorating a bit. And you know, there's been there's been jokes out there, right? Where's the bat signal? Is the picture of the penguin, you know, coming to take over <laughs> in New York City? It kind of feels that way, right? Um, but this is this is the reality. You know, you look at a, a movie like Batman, for instance, and you know, like, oh, Gotham City, New York could never be like that. Post COVID, <laughs> you know, it's questionable as to what was uh, what was going on here. Uh, but Jimmy, I, I want to talk to the folks that are in law enforcement right now that are getting towards the end of their career. 
um, that are considering like private sector and all that. What's some words of encouragement you might have or, or what are your thoughts on that? First of all, I'd like to say thank you for your service. Um, and look, whether you're in the military and, and you know, Home Depot is offering you a 10 percent discount on on home goods, you know, if you're a veteran or you're a, a law enforcement officer and the local coffee shop says, hey, look, thank you for what you do. The coffee is on us. Um, I think the vast majority of Americans on both sides of the political spectrum appreciate what law enforcement officers do on a, on a daily basis. Has it gotten worse and more difficult to, to enforce the law in this country? Absolutely. I retired in 2016. I cannot imagine what it's like to be on the job today. And one of the things that I do and you do is try to highlight um, the great work that people in the policing profession where, you know, your your decision to go into harm's way for somebody you, you may or may not know is just it goes along with the business. Um, so we have to respect and we have to appreciate what law enforcement officers do. Having said that, um, you know, you know, I serve as a mayor of a, of a small upstate yeah. village in New York State. One of the first things I did, and it was a surprise to some people, was my first quote unquote executive order, although I had to get a board vote to support it, but they were going to they were going to agree with me on this was to ensure that all of our police officers in my small bucolic upstate New York village were body worn cameras, because I believe that body worn cameras um, actually help law enforcement because the vast majority of cops and, and, and law enforcement officers are doing the right things. And for the 1% or, or, or less than 1% that aren't, we want that exposure via body one camera, but it's going to protect and it's going to help the vast majority of us that are doing the right things. Um, mm -hmm. Look, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tough time to be a cop in this, in this nation. You know, you've got people like, Alvin Bragg and, and other of the quote-unquote progressive prosecutors, Alvin Bragg is obviously the DA in Manhattan, um, mm -hmm. who are making decisions that are completely counter to what we underwent in the early 90s. And I was a law enforcement officer that came into New York City in 1991 when mm -hmm. broken windows policing, stop question and frisk, comp stat, that kind of proactive policing took New York City from one of the most dangerous cities in the world to one of the safest cities in the entire world. So it's that thing you got to grapple with. The pendulum always swings too far in one direction or the other. I agree. Sometimes you got to reassess things. But I think what we're doing now, Matt, is making things tougher for the people that live in those communities, those underserved communities and those communities where crime is rampant to feel safe. Yeah. And, you know, you, you talk about the body camera stuff and it, it is so, so important on that. It's almost like vindication. Right. And yeah. it, it, and it works both ways. Right. It's the person who's wearing the camera. It says, okay, I'm wearing a camera. I know everything's being recorded. Right. Uh, but it, it's also the person who sees the camera on the body of the officer that says, okay, you know, I, I, I got to behave myself here because, you know, <laughs> someone's going to be playing that in my, in my 20 year reunion, <laughs> right? So maybe, yep. um, or, or, or my parole hearing, <laughs> depending on what I'm doing. Right. So I, I think that it, it, there's that deterrence, there's the safety and, and then there's the deterrence factor of it too. And as a, uh, somebody in, in the private field too, who investigates incidents, right. That's what I get hired to do, whether it be, uh, an accident or, or, criminal activity or, or things like that, that footage is super important, you know, and knowing that it's out there and that you can request it, you can foil it, you can make a, a motion to, you know, have motion practice, having a, a judge, you know, sign an order to show cause to turn that over. Like that's another avenue that you can take, right? And understanding that it's out there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it's it's two things. I think one is in what you just highlighted was transparency. As law enforcement officers, we should be held to a higher standard, right? We carry um, uh, a sidearm or weaponry and are allowed to take a life if it's a righteous decision, whereas we feel that our own life or the life of an innocent or grievous bodily harm um, is being threatened, we're allowed to do that. That is yeah. a huge uh, consequential 
um, decision to be that kind of an arbiter, to decide to be able to take a life, to, you know, to use a weapon to stop somebody that we perceive as a threat. But we should also be held accountable. And I think Graham v. O'Connor, which I think was a Supreme Court case, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, so hopefully nobody fact checks me on this. But fact, they fact do, checking going on in my end. <laughs> I think it was a 19, I think it was a 1989 Supreme Court case, which talked yeah. about objective reasonableness. We right. hold law enforcement officers to a different standard, but we have to be objective about it. And if right. they're responding to something in low light conditions and they're responding to a crisis incident where it is a it is a situation where, uh, you know, death is part of that, making that decision to turn that corner or to engage that violent subject. Um, was the officer acting reasonably? We should hold them to a higher standard. Absolutely. They're trained and they're given that state sanctioned that authority to take a life. They should be held to a higher standard. However, objective reasonableness also works on the other way to say you weren't there dealing with that low light conditions. And that's where body worn cameras now come into play where they can help. They can yeah. help outline that story and that person fumbling with their waistband and refusing to follow lawful commands to comply the officer felt threatened that incident and had to to take a defensive action or defensive posture and possibly you know take a life so i think it's a it's a good thing and i think again as long as we apply the objective reasonable standard yes officers are outfitted with the ability and you know the support of the state to take a life if necessary by the same sure. token they should be held to a higher standard i agree with that Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, this isn't like a debate here. I'm not fat, fact checking you on the fly <laughs> and, and, and commenting along the way. So we're, we're, we're going to leave it at that. Um, it, it, these are all they, they, they great points, right? So we're going to uh, jump out and take a break real quick. When we come back, I want to talk about, um, you know, how did we get to this state? You, you talk about like what it was like when you were retiring in 2016. And then what it's like now and what are some of the key factors that you see may, maybe policy or or just the general attitudes of people that brought us to that so we're going to put a pin in it we're going to take a break uh hear from the sponsors and we'll, we'll jump back in okay everyone sit tight after four years of development scope now is proud to announce the release of grid grid combines osint with real-time physical data to achieve new levels of intelligence gathering Grid supports over 50 data types and hundreds of thousands of sources. Upgrade your OSIN capabilities with Grid and elevate your intelligence team today at scopenow.com. The Campbell Group has teamed up with PI Perspectives to offer listeners top-notch, affordable insurance solutions. Private investigators can get insurance for their business for as low as $305 per year. Apply now at piperspectivesinsurance.com and receive a quote back within 24 hours. Check out the PI Institute of Education at piinstitute.com. Since 1989, Kelly Riddle has been teaching on subjects such as surveillance, nursing home investigations, insurance fraud, domestic investigations, hidden assets, and accident scene investigations. The PI Institute of Education is a featured learning partner in the investigatorstoolbox.com. So check out the free content on the site, then visit the Institute for more great savings on additional classes. Over the past year, our industry has been the target of foreign governments and agencies that have attempted to recruit unsuspecting investigators to gather intelligence or immediate expatriates. PI Perspectives is teaming up with the Federal Bureau of Investigations to get the word out about this ongoing crisis. If you've been contacted by an individual or company that might seem suspicious, please contact the FBI at tips.fbi.gov. You can also contact the New York Field Office at 212-384-1000 to report suspicious activity in any state. The link is also in the show notes. Even if you completed a job and it still doesn't sit right with you, you can report this activity. The only way to stop this trend is to work together. So let's do it. 
Are you an investigator that can't find the time for research, or are you stuck on a case that has given you issues? Satellite Investigations has a dedicated research team that specializes in skip tracing and defendant locates. But our expert researchers use a balanced technique of research and pretext know-how to authenticate data and get you the answers you need. Contact us today by emailing us at newcase at satellitepi.com. And welcome back to PI Perspectives. This is Matt Sperry, your host. We're, we're having some di crazy discussions today, some, some heated, passionate uh, discussions on law enforcement uh, with our good friend, James Gagliano. Jimmy, welcome back to the program. Good to be back with you, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's just keep pushing down and, and drilling down on, on uh, the topic. Before we took a break, um, I teased about talking about uh, the conditions society, right? When you retired in 2016, as opposed to now in 2024. And it, it's definitely, it's a different temperature, right? And and what are some of the key factors along the way, do you think that that have brought it to the point that we're dealing with these issues now? Well, that's a, that's a great lead up to this. I, I think, you know, in the academic world, we always wanna make sure that we're looking at something that isn't a tiny sample set, right? You have to have a sample set that is broad enough and inclusive enough that you can say, all right, in this instance, correlation equals causality because you can't do that if you're only looking at two instances or five or ten you've got you've got to broaden your aperture so let's go back and look at this it was 10 years ago this summer that michael brown was shot and killed by a police officer in ferguson missouri by the name of darren wilson and that's when the first pushback and the first rioting. And I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting it's the first time in U.S. history. Go back and look at 1968. Um, you know, look at what happened in 1991 um, out in out in L.A. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting this was the first time, but you had a community that erupted, um, you know, in defense of Michael Brown. Now, Michael Brown was a teenager. He was 19 years old who had just committed a strong arm robbery of a local business. And then when he was stopped and confronted by a police officer, he decided to attack the police officer, try to disarm him, and he got shot and killed. But sure. that case was kind of the inflection point. Um, just like Rodney King was the case out in 1991, that was an inflection point, where it was yes. really the first time where a video camera highlighted something that had happened um, yeah. and caused a national, um, you know, reckoning, if you will. So Michael Brown, that was 10 years ago. That's hard to believe. Then in 2015, you had a number of cases, whether it was Eric Garner in Staten Island, um, mm -hmm. whether it was a, a case in, in Louisiana where police officers responding to somebody with a gun, and it caused this 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 groundswell or um, this uh, the, the the catalyst I guess to you know for Black Lives Matter to become a thing if you will and a, yeah. and a movement um, and the progressive prosecutor movement at the same time. Okay, so let's start with Michael Brown. In 2014, that case was investigated by the President Obama appointed Attorney General Eric Holder, and the determination was made that this was a quote unquote righteous shooting, that there was no, you know, racial disparity, racial animus that caused that police officer to take that life. But it doesn't matter because it spawned the hands up, don't shoot trope and lie and fallacy. And then, of course, you fast forward to 2020. Look, I'm not going to dispense. I'm not going to, um, you know, try to defend Officer Chauvin and what happened in Minneapolis the sure. day after Memorial Day in 2020. But again, another inflection point, and that has, as I said prior to the break, that has caused this pendulum over course correction where the pendulum swings. You know, do we need to rein in certain police practices at some point in time in our country's history? Yes. Mm -hmm. Has policing been used in the past um, to enforce racial, um, you know, racial laws or Jim Crow down in the Deep South? I grew up in the Deep South. Um, so, of course, you'd be you'd be lying if you said that that wasn't the case. Where things are now today um, is every action taken against a person of color, you know, tainted or 
or colored, for lack of a better term, colored by um, racial animus or white supremacy? The answer is no. We all get that. But unfortunately, Matt, to my point, the pendulum over course corrects, and we're still in that far left side right now. It's got to come back down more toward the middle where I'll leave you with this before you Makes come sense. in. <laughs> At the height of the Black Lives Matter protests and riots that took place in 2020, the summer of 2020, African-Americans were um, polled by the Pew Research Center, Pew, P-E-W, which is a highly respected, it's like Gallup, highly respected, yep. highly respected poll. 81% of them were asked and decided that they wanted more or, uh, I'm sorry, they wanted the same amount or more policing in their neighborhoods than was currently underway. This is at the height of the protests and the riots. So 81%. So the underserved communities, the communities of color, minority communities, the disenfranchised communities, they recognize that crime is a big issue there. They don't want the police to walk away and do what the progressives want, which is right. to stay out. We're gonna de-police. That doesn't make their community safer. They doesn't, want more yeah. or the same. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen, boy, this is a lot to unpack here. <laughs> yeah, uh, which, which is good, but it, but it, it bears the discussion, right? So, you know, you, you start talking about the differences, and and you had mentioned some things, and and I think it's a huge difference as to why it's so impactful today, and why it's so like in your face as opposed to some of these other instances that you talked about. Because, I mean, imagine if Rodney King took place today with all the technology that we have out there with, with the ability to people to mobilize and, and have these discussions, like it would have played out completely different, like, it, and not in a good way. <laughs> I mean, it really, really would have, um, you know, escalated, I think, to a point that, that, you know, you now have multiple cities that are looting and burning and, and doing all that technology wasn't quite there yet. We relied more on television. So I think this shift over to people getting their news in different ways, right? Uh, online, TikTok. <laughs> I mean, you, you name it, right? They're going on uh, Instagram. They're going on Facebook. Like, they're, that's how people are getting their news. No one's watching the news channels anymore. You yeah, know, really. They're looking for for sound bites. You know, I, I think the most times I'm watching your old employer is when I'm on an elevator. You know, <laughs> it's like okay, I'm going up to the floor. This thing's on. I'm, I'm listening. I'm watching. Right. Um, but that's the reality of it. We just don't have the time. We're all uh, out and doing it. Or in, in, when you're in your car, right, uh, listening to a, a satellite radio news station or, or something like that to, to to get the impact. So I think that technology has has really mm -hmm. changed the perception of how things uh, are are being done. And, and like these these stats that you're putting out, you know, I, I think it's interesting to say that yes, that these communities want more policing. But, it, you know, it's like how they want to be policed, though, is a different story, right? And it's like you can have your cake and eat it, too, you know. And you start talking about New York City and the big thing in, in New York prior to COVID was bail reform. People are like, what the heck's going on here? You know, people are committing crimes and they're getting out the same day and they're just creating, you know, committing those crimes over and over again. And you talk about a, a pendulum being swung a certain way. You're, you're seeing the officer, the B cop, going, why am I even enforcing this stuff? Yeah. You know, like what's the bother? You know, like, why, why do, why do I even need to do my job? What I'm supposed to do be, if the guy's going to be out anyway. So that, that just distaste and that frustration um, uh, of that policy, like, you know, you look at legalization of marijuana too, like people don't, didn't anticipate it was going to uh, work out the way that it worked out. Right. And, and, and the same thing with opening up the city to let people in. Oh, this is a great thing. We'll just take everybody. Not a problem until it's a problem, right? So yeah. it, it's interesting to see the policies and, and the intentions and then, then what actually ends up happening when real life sets in. And now we've got technology all around to capture all this stuff and to comment on it. This is what we do as humans, right? We have an opinion, we, we, we comment on things. We definitely don't agree all the time, but we have, we have comments on things. So it, it's, it becomes more polarizing. And I think that's really what it comes down to. There are no small stories anymore. Everything mm -hmm. that happens is polarized and thank God for the technology that's out there with the body cams and the accountability um, of, of, of everybody that we have a chance to tell a, a side of a story that may not have been able to be told because there was no 
nobody to back it up, nobody to, to say, yes, I saw what happened. And, and, you know, this is a complete overreaction to the way it was handled uh, or vice versa. Yeah, it was, I completely screwed this thing up. Right. So you, it, it almost like you have the, another voice just to, to another medium to see what happened. Right. Yeah. I mean, and look at how, you know, look at how police sciences, which was really the first kind of study of enforcing the law um, from a theoretical perspective that we began with and police sciences came out. Um, we weren't able to take latent fingerprints until the early 1930s. Uh, we couldn't do blood spatter evidence, um, you know, until around that time. DNA. Right? The yeah. size of your head, you're a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> the way your head looks. D DNA as a tool for investigation and prosecution, it wasn't used in the UK until I think 1985 successfully. And I want to say the United States, not till 1987. So late 80s, which wasn't that long ago that we were able to use DNA. You, your point about body-worn cameras and about technology and Rodney King, the fact that some guy with a camcorder that probably looked like the WSB TV, yeah. you know, big <laughs> right. camcorder up on his deck, you know, yeah. and doing that. And now today people do it with a, uh, you know, with, 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 a, with, with a cell phone. Um, look at New York City. So yeah. New York City is comprised of five boroughs. The, the, the borough of Manhattan... I don't know if there is a street or thoroughfare that does not have some type of video surveillance, whether it's done by law enforcement, the city, or private entities with ring doorbells or a security camera at a bodega. The entire city, the entire island of Manhattan is blanketed by that. Now, here's the problem with that, Matt, is that people watch that on CSI Miami on TV and they go, well, hell, I'm not yeah. convicting somebody unless you show me DNA evidence and the video footage and you go, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. The investigation of crimes, it's not always perfect and neat and you can solve it in one hour, but yeah. that's what the level of expectation is. We become a victim of our own excellence where in law yeah. enforcement, unless you can show me he did it on video and, and, and show me via DNA evidence, I'm not going to convict him. Well, you bring up a good point, right? So, so that's that's the downfall of of the technology, right? That's that's uh, something that you have to be considered. the expectation, expectation of a jury, yeah. Um, and you know, tying in now also uh, talking to the folks that are listening to this that are that are retired law enforcement or, or private practice. Um, I know we do it here in New York, but that video recovery um, that is a it's a great revenue stream. Like if you can understand how to obtain that video, if you, I have experts that work for me that they, they're familiar with certain drivers, you know, going to, and what that means is going to like a private system and the, the, uh, the software that you need to be actually able to view the video. Like there, there are certain specific kinds, like you can really, um, uh, you know, add to your level of services that you're offering by, by, by having that, that kind of stuff. And as an investigator, when you show up to the scene of, of an incident, whether it be a crime or, or uh, something on the civil side, you need to look for, for those videos. I mean, it, it's, it's part of what we do uh, privately um, in my business model, anywhere we go, we're looking for video cameras and you'd be surprised like you were saying, Jimmy, with the, like the ring cameras and, and all that, you could be out in the suburbs and you, you'll find stuff. You'll be surprised what's out there. So being able to utilize that particular technology to, uh, to enhance uh, the work product that you're, you're, you're putting out there is definitely something to consider, but man, like it's so interesting that um, policy can then be dictated on that too. Right. Um, of, of a juror's idea about, uh, I got to see a video or I'm not, or I'm not, you know, not guilty. You know, if I yeah. can't see it, right. And then, okay. All right. So let's throw a curveball here. Let's yeah. talk about AI and, and deep fakes. Uh, you see the video? I'll make a video for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you now throw that in there and yeah. it's like, Oh man, I didn't think about that. Here we go. All right. Hold on to your butts. Right. So that, well, that's another side effect, I think. Yeah. And I think it uh, just to knit this together and, and kind of close this little segment out here. Um, look at it from this perspective. I think a lot of people, not your listeners, because your listeners and viewers are generally educated in this matter and understand this, but um, you can be convicted of a crime 
on circumstantial evidence. And I don't, I think there's people who go, oh, no, 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 uh, he can't be convicted. That's circumstantial evidence. You get enough circumstantial evidence together and a DA or a prosecutor brings that to a jury, yes, you can. Oh, and Jimmy, unless you can find the quote unquote smoking gun, the murder weapon, you can't be convicted of murder. That's yeah. not true either. And I think yeah. that's something I think we need to educate folks on that you can be convicted of a murder without the murder weapon being found. And yeah. you can be convicted of a crime due to circumstantial evidence. So no matter how good technology gets, it is not the panacea, the end all, cure all, be all. You still have to do good police work. You still have yeah. to build a case that you bring to a jury and you commit, you know, you convince. 12 people, 12 of the accused peers that this person is guilty. That's the way it yeah. should work. Yeah. And I, and we'll, you know, we'll kind of move on here. Um, and you know, just encouraging those that are in law enforcement right now, where those are, are, are comp you know, just complete law enforcement. Now they're getting in the private sector. Like there, there is a, a like, don't be discouraged. <laughs> it's a world for you. You know, it, you, you can make a living doing this stuff. You can, <laughs> Be proud of the of, of the work that you do, like the position that you hold. Like I would tell all my NYPD brother brothers and sisters out there, don't apologize to anybody for being a police officer if there's problems up the chain, right? right. You're out there every day, you're doing your thing, and and um, it's admirable, um, especially as conditions get get worse here. I appreciate uh, everybody that's out there doing it, and um, you know you can still parlay those that that work experience into a post career um and, and feel good about it <laughs> you can actually help people um you know one of the things also i i see a lot of uh, criminal investigators start working for defense like criminal defense like uh and, and just kind of wrapping that around the way they think um of like okay you know i've seen the bad guys here but now i'm going to work for a firm that not necessarily um, is, is proving the guy's innocence, but but looking for reasonable doubt, right? You start talking about before you could get convicted. I think it swings both ways, right? Uh, reasonable reasonable doubt, like there's a different different de definition on that. Like, how do you define that? People have different impressions of what reasonable but reasonable doubt means, right? Um, and it, if you're working as an investigator and you're gathering intel um, to maybe um, lessen the charge, oh person's guilty of what they did, but not at a, at a felony level, maybe, you know, let me go interview and really like get, get, um, get the details of what's out there and make sure that this person gets a fair shake in, in what our judicial system says that, that you, you have to, you know, abide by. Right. So that's another avenue as well that people don't, don't realize. And, uh, that there's that ability to take the skills of what you have and, 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 and put it in a way that you're able to use it um, in different ways and still sleep at night. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes absolute sense. And, uh, you know, I think you can, uh, you know, you can appreciate this as well. You know, when I was a young FBI agent in 1991 and, you know, we would, you know, we would make a case against a mobster or against a gun runner or a drug runner or a violent, you know, street gang criminal. Um, and you would find out who the defense counsel was or who they were bringing in as an expert witness. And I always remember, you know, some of the senior agents and the senior cops that I was working under saying, yeah, he decided to go to the dark side. And it was right. always like a little chuckle that you would give that, yes, this person served, generally speaking, they were retired, whether it was FBI or NYPD or any other organization in law enforcement. And they, and they, and they went to work for the defense. Um, and it was kind of like, there was a little bit of derision there. Like, yeah, went to the dark side. The bottom line is our legal system, which again is imperfect and flawed, is the best in the world. Um, show me a better one. Is it perfect? No. Is it infallible? No. Do innocent people get convicted of crimes? Yes. Do the guilty get off? Yes. But the bottom line is, God forbid, Maddie, that I get charged with some kind of horrific crime. Who am I going to call? I want the de best defense attorney again to establish that reasonable, you know, doubt 
um, to say that, hey, it didn't happen the way that you think. We hear what the state or the government's position is, but we also want you to think about this. And the burden of proof is on the government. We have to be right. We're the arbiters. We're the ones that bring the case. It's got to be perfect. Um, and I think that's a healthy thing. I've got a yeah. different opinion now of former colleagues. Of I've never worked for the defense before. I've had people call me and ask me to. And trust me, it's not because I'm considering myself to be, you know, above that or whatever. I just have too much going on right now. But I understand and appreciate colleagues of mine. The system has to work where you have yeah. advocates for the people and advocates for the defendant. And sure. I think that's a healthy thing. Listen, an expert is an expert. Yeah. If you're, if you're a qualified expert, you, you're entitled to have an opinion. Now, how that person who hires you spins that opinion, that, 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 who knows, right? Uh, yeah. But yeah, I don't hold that against anybody. Um, and, and, and there's, I'll, I'll take it one step further before we close out here. Um, I know people in, in the industry now that have post law enforcement career, people that have super high up positions where they get hired on police misconduct cases. Right. And, and some of the former law enforcement are like, how could you do that? Like, that's, that's disgusting. Like, like shame on you for doing that. And you know what their position is? I'm not indicting you buddy. I'm indicting policy. Maybe there's a problem with the policy that was in place that that shows that 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 there was an issue so if i'm being brought in as an expert it's not to condemn your actions it's to examine the policy of you know you what you were supposed to work under that particular policy to see if it in fact is a good policy or a bad policy and you got to look at it that way so don't you know give me the side eye or, or or you know give me crap about it because i'm actually here for your benefit like you should appreciate that and i was like that's great. That's such a cool angle to take a look at. And when you understand it, it's like, okay, this makes sense. I understand now. Yeah. Um, I think you, I think you, you um, put it out perfectly. And if you give me an opportunity to make any type of uh, promotion or shilling for something, I don't know if oh, shilling is the right term. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so, so what you just described, uh, Matt, which I think was, was, perfect and spot on the way that you described it um, is how I've described the work of the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund, where I, I sit on the board of directors. Um, every case that gets brought before our board for support, which generally we support um, law enforcement officers, whether it's police, state troopers, federal sure. agents that are unjustly accused of a crime, um, where we think that the prosecution got it wrong. And we all worked within the prosecutorial system on the side of the government or on the side of the DA. But if we think they got it wrong, we take those cases on. We support those officers. We pay for their legal fees. We pay mm -hmm. to keep the lights on at, at their house if they were suspended without pay or fired. That doesn't mean that every case that comes to us is a righteous case, just like every case that's brought before a court of law is a righteous case. But our job is to look at it, sift through it. And if I can just put this out for your listeners, policedefense.org, policedefense.org. And again, not every case that gets brought to us is a righteous case, and we'll assign our name to and say, we're going to support you. Um, but we look at it, we weigh the facts as, as, as we know them and sense them, looking at body-worn camera video, um, other video camera, the facts of the case, and we make a deter uh, determination. So that was a great lead-up to me making yeah. a big push that anybody wants to go there, see what we do. Um, it's yeah. been an organization around since the mid-'90s. It was started by former Attorney General Edwin Meese. I am privileged. I think it's one of my greatest callings to be a, a small member of that board of directors that actually watches looks at these cases, reads the narratives, looks at the video, and then make an assessment on whether or not we're going to support them or not. So thank you for that, Matt, for giving me that yeah, opportunity. No, no, no problem. We're going to put a, a link to that in the show notes too. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, and, and again, that wasn't the intention of doing this podcast. Yeah. Uh, we're just kind of, you know, shooting the breeze here of the state of the state um, of law enforcement slash investigations and and how do, how do we survive in a, in a political environment that seems to be eating itself um, and still um, make a living and, and do whatever. Um, so Jim, thank you so much for coming on. You, you are a national treasure. Uh, I hope you will, uh, appreciate um, the dedication here. Uh, and I, I love that you're always willing to come on and, and talk. You've never said no to me uh, to jump on and have a discussion. And I really appreciate that. And um you know, we need people like that. We need advocates. We need people that are not afraid to have a conversation 
right? And 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 do so in a respectful manner, which the politicians can't even do it. <laughs> so uh, being able to have you know just discussion and listen, you you and I, we have the same political view. Like we, I, I feel like we're pretty much on the same page. So it's like it's not a debate, but it's a discussion, right? Yeah. And I think it's a healthy discussion, and, and like you need to do things like this. So I'm grateful for you taking the time to come on. I hope everybody appreciated this stuff and, and didn't turn it off after like the first two minutes. So, uh. Well, I, pre I appreciate what you do. And I've obviously listened and seen, um, you know, podcasts of yours that, that don't just include me on it. And I appreciate what you do. And again, you and I agree on a lot of things. There's a lot of things that you and I don't agree on. And we probably have a healthy and robust debate about that. But you provide people an opportunity to come up and use this platform to kind of speak about what their thoughts are. And I think it's a good and healthy thing. I think demystification of the law enforcement profession is is really the charter and the gift that you give is that people can 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 tune into something which might be a volatile topic, you know, the particular shootings that we talked about or different policing methodologies that people may agree with or disagree with and hear people talking about them in a, in a sane way and not shouting at each other. And I think yep. that's a great service. So thanks for what you do. Good stuff. All right. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll catch you guys next time on the next episode. Take care. Thanks for checking out the show. It was truly a great discussion and we hope you appreciated the insight. Jim is a real treasure to the industry and is not afraid to have tough discussions. Please check out the link to the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. We also want to thank our newest sponsor, Four Pillars, for sponsoring our podcast. Additional thanks to Campbell Insurance Group, Track Ops, Scope Now, and the PI Institute for Education. Also, don't forget about InvestigatorsToolbox.com, where you can type in Perspectives 50 to save 50 bucks when you join up. Also, follow Matt and Satellite Investigations on LinkedIn. And if you have a question or a comment about the show, email Matt at MatthewS at SatellitePI.com. You can also find him on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. We'd like your feedback to bring you the best shows possible. And we'll be back next week with a new show, so make sure you tune in and stay safe out there.